Hi everyone, and uh, welcome to the latest uh, episode, I guess, of Big Ideas Live. I'm Janet Nielsen. I'm your host, and I'm actually on site today. As if you uh, if you normally watch, you normally know that I'm uh, I'm in one screen and my guest is in another. But I'm actually at the University of Toronto Mississauga with our guest today, who's Professor Pierre Desrochers, who's a associate professor of geography here, um, and he's also uh, the co-author with his wife of this great book, The Locavore's Dilemma, and if you've been paying attention to my emails, you'll know that uh, by attending tonight, you are going to be entered in a draw to win one of five books. Um, and we're going to talk tonight about uh, whether or not we can feed the world, which I think is an important question. Um, so I guess we can get right into it. Uh, and I wanted to start off with a question that I learned from the book, which was, or not, it's not really a question, it's sort of a lesson that I learned, and I really liked, uh, I appreciated it in the book, was, when we're unhappy, people, a lot of people are unhappy with how we grow our food now, but uh, we, they kind of look at it as it is now and then say, well, we should go back to how it was. But they don't ask, why did we change things in the first place? And I think that's a good question to ask. Yes. So why don't we talk about why we grow our food the way we do now? Yeah, of course, no system is perfect, and there are, there's always room for improvement. I mean, after all, uh, the most sensible definition of progress you can think of is creating lesser problems than those that yeah. existed before. And that's exactly what happened through the development of our, our modern food supply chain. Uh, people tend to forget that, you know, you don't need to go back uh, all that far in time, but two centuries ago, before the advent of the railroad and uh, the uh, steamship, most of the food that people were eating was produced, not even within 100 miles of where they live, but probably more something like 50 miles. And that's because uh, land transportation was so bad. So yes, if you lived in a coastal city, you could import cod from Newfoundland, but moving cereal grain over land was very difficult. So even for a city like Paris, all the way up to the early 19th century, most of the grain supply was really within 50 miles of uh, the city. But what happened then in the 19th century is that James Watt came along, the steam engine came along, and suddenly it became possible to move large quantities of food economically over long distances. And so increasingly what happened is that people discovered that growing certain types of food in certain locations just made more sense than trying to grow everything close to you. So people stopped producing most of their foods for themselves. They stopped producing a lot of different things rather inefficiently close to where they live. And they began to import food from uh, locations that had better growing conditions for certain types of food. Yeah, which is great. Um, I, that was, like, as I said, one of my favorite uh, lessons from the book. Um, and we're going to get a, a little bit into economics here uh, because something that I've noticed when people talk about local food is, for instance, in Canada, the push for local food often comes from somewhere like uh, British Columbia, where they can grow a lot of things. And in economics, there are two concepts called absolute advantage and comparative advantage. So BC, especially um, the, the more fertile part. The, the lower not, mainland. The, yeah, not, not, not up in the mountains. It's hard to grow things in the mountain, but the lower mainland in BC, you can grow almost everything. And in somewhere like, say, uh, sorry, we've gotten a little bit Canadian. We are in, we are in Well, let's uh, say Toronto. Berkeley. In the United yeah. States, a lot of it came from Berkeley, <laughs> so, which is more close to the Central Valley of California right. and uh, the wine region of yeah, Napa Valley for, and others. So. For, for sure. Whereas if you've got somewhere like Montana or somewhere like uh, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, uh, I can almost guarantee that no one will ever get a box of strawberries that says grown in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. But I mean, maybe. But why did that? Why, why did that yeah. happen? And I'm sure that you know, <laughs> if you had gone back in time, maybe a hundred years ago, perhaps some people were growing strawberries in greenhouses in Moose Jaw. Mm -hmm. um, I have pictures that I use in some of my presentations of you know, people growing cucumber near Minneapolis, Minnesota, and people used to have actually huge greenhouses close to uh, large cities a century ago because it was the only way to uh, get fresh produce. I mean, you could ship things like, you know, dry cut, uh, wine, cereal grains over long distances, but before the advent of uh, modern preservation technologies, refrigeration, you actually had a lot of greenhouses around large cities, but eventually even those disappeared. And why was that? Well, think of it this way. Uh, there are, as uh, Janet was saying, both absolute and comparative advantages in growing food. So yes, uh, if we cross the border here, we're in Toronto, there is a botanical garden in uh, Buffalo that was built mm -hmm. about a century ago, and they have a banana tree in there. Right. So you can grow a banana in Buffalo, but why don't they grow more than just one banana? Why, why don't they have more than one banana tree? 
Well, because it just doesn't make sense economically. You need to heat the greenhouse. Yeah. And this requires a lot of uh, natural gas or electricity or, I mean, it's the, same, uh, the building is a century old, a lot of steam in that case. So it just happens that, you know, a location like Guatemala or Honduras just has better conditions to grow bananas. So this is basically what happened in North America. People stopped uh, producing things inexpensively in large greenhouses because they realized that, you know, uh, upstate New York, for example, might be good at growing apples, but uh, for growing citrus fruit, well, Florida just has the better climate. Yeah. And even if you look at orange production these days, a lot of people don't realize that Florida produces oranges mostly for juice and uh, processed food, whereas the oranges that you find in your supermarket will come from California. Yeah. Why is that? Well, California has a drier climate. They have less of a fungus problem. They can produce higher quality uh, products. So even within areas that can grow oranges, some are actually better than others uh, yeah. for, uh, for growing certain things. So this is really absolute uh, advantage. But then you've got this, no, you've got other cases where you could grow where two regions, which will be at different levels of economic development, could grow the same type uh, of food. But in those cases, what happens is that, well, in some places, uh, labor uh, costs mm -hmm. or the jobs that people can get will either make it attractive to work in producing the types of crops that require a lot of labor, let's say, produce. But in other regions of the world, people might have better opportunities. They might mm -hmm. be a bit better educated. They might be able to design software to produce other things. So in the case of comparative advantage, some people have simply um, a, uh, an, an advantage in specializing in certain things rather than others, even though they might, uh, on the surface of it, have the same type of agricultural conditions or physical geography conditions. Yeah, and some examples, uh, we were talking a little bit about this beforehand. Uh, we don't just dive into these things with you guys. We do talk about it beforehand. And so, some examples, uh, well, one that jumps to mind that we actually didn't talk about is coffee. Yes. Uh, this is one of the reasons that people are very concerned about trying to get a better a better deal for coffee farmers is because uh, coffee is extremely labor intensive. As far as I know, that you just have to pick Well, it actually, no, no, there are two types oh, of there are coffee. Two types. There are two okay. types. There are Robusta and Arabica. Robusta is the kind of a cheap one that is that comes from Brazil, which is grown in flat plains, and you can actually mechanize, mechanize production. Oh, okay. But the higher quality stuff, the shade grown uh, on hills and stuff, is yeah. actually very labor intensive. Yeah. Okay. And so yes. Okay. So I used to work. I used to work at a Starbucks, and so to them, all coffee must be uh, done yes. by hand. But they don't use robusta beans. Yes. So uh, yeah. And uh, another one that I I, uh, I had to study at, in school was uh, snow peas in Guatemala. So you can probably grow snow peas just fine. In California, but the the um, American workers in California are probably not. You know, it's hard work to it's bend over work. and and pick peas in the quantities that you would need to supply an American uh, supermarket. And at the same time, in a place like Guatemala, these might be the best paying jobs that people yeah. have, and it makes more sense for them to grow these things and export them to people who have more money than them. They yeah. make a better living that way than growing um, more things for themselves. Yeah, and and that's really what comparative advantage is about. It's about the relative cost rather than the absolute cost. So um, unfortunately, hopefully one day this changes. If you live on uh, kind of the, low, the lowland mountains in Guatemala, that's you're not giving up that much to become a snow pea farmer. Um, there, you don't have that and many. You're actually other, improving your standard. Yeah, of you don't have many other options. Whereas, if you were a snow pea farmer in California, you may be able to. You might be more efficient at growing snow peas than people in Guatemala, but you've got better. Opportunities. Yeah, you you can you can go work in a, in San Francisco, or you could start a startup like everyone else in California. Um, and so that's kind of that's kind of the point is. Um, by taking advantage of the relative costs, that's how we really make people better off. And um, why, in my opinion, at least, we should be a little bit less concerned about uh, when our when our th our food comes from poor farmers. The best way to improve things for them is to improve their their options. Let them, as long as they're free to do what they want, if they specialize in export crops, it's probably because it is the best option available yeah. to them. And again, our ancestors used to be subsistence farmers. They used to produce all their own food. At one point, they got out of farming or they specialized in one type of farming. They improved their standards of living that way, and that's how everybody's better off. Consumers got more food at a more affordable price. And paradoxically, by specializing in export crops, uh, those poor farmers, even though they might not be paid much by North American standards, are still earning a better living than the options that would be available to them in the absence of the opportunity of exporting them yeah. these foods. And even though they're not growing their own food, they have pretty constant 
access. Well, to then, then they, now they have the money to yeah, buy food exactly. from people who are better than them at producing those uh, other types of food. Yeah, and so um, I think it's a really important lesson uh, to learn because it, it's, a, it's a little bit counterintuitive to think that, you know, really California, they can grow a lot of food, so why do they only specialize it? Well, I mean, they actually grow a lot of kinds of food, yes. but um, well, they produce why do they a specialize lot of produce, at all? Yeah. But California, for example, used to produce a lot of grain in the 19th century. Oh, interesting. But at one point in time, uh, the northern plains were open with the advent of the railroad, and so grain production shifted, I'm talking about wheat and, and you know, barley, things like that, shifted from California to places uh, like North and South Dakota. And what farmers did in uh, California, rather than going bankrupt, is that they began to grow citrus fruits and other things okay. for which their soil and their climate was better suited. And everybody was better off in the end. The farmers in the Dakotas were better at producing wheat. The farmers in California were better at producing citrus fruit. And in the end, both farmers could both get citrus fruit and wheat more cheaply than if the people in North Dakota had tried to grow citrus fruit in greenhouses right. and people in California to grow grain in an environment that was not as suitable as the Dakotas. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's amazing, actually. Uh, everyone, just so you know, I, we were, I was talking about this with some friends yesterday. Every time we see PR speak, we learn something. So go out and make friends with your local economic geographers or, or a, a, a far away economic geographer no, if they happen to be higher quality. <laughs> so actually, uh, I wanted to kind of cover uh, that issue of comparative advantage and why we do the things we do. I wanted to put those ideas in everybody's head. And I want to stop for questions if anybody has any. And while we're doing the questions, uh, I am going to ask a quick poll question, which will pop up on your screen in front of us. And I'll give you a few, a few moments to, uh, to answer it. And if you have any questions, let us know. Um, but if not, uh, do let us know what you think about the polls, and we can always uh, address the questions that you've got in the polls. Oh, and we've got a question. So let me just make it big enough to read. Sorry, guys. Okay, so what we've got is, what would it take to effectively distribute food to the developing world without further loss of natural habitat? The developing economies of Africa, India, South America, and throughout Asia obviously need food, but how do we convince people in those areas to stop destroying the natural habitat for farmland? Okay. That's a great question. Yeah, well, you have to think that North America was not very different uh, two centuries ago. Again, before the railroad and the steamships, or think of it, even of steamboats going up and down the Mississippi, most people in North America had to produce most of their food for themselves because, again, if you were living in Appalachia, where you did not have uh, access to a navigable river, you needed to grow as many things as you could close to home. Mm -hmm. But eventually, what happened? Well, these people got connected to the rest of the world with modern transportation infrastructure. And what you see happening in the United States in the, last, in the late 19th century is that suddenly some regions began to specialize in things that they were better at. Uh, you know, to use examples that uh, people might know, if you ever watch a football game with the Green Bay Packers, you see those cheese head in the audience, yeah. right? So if you've ever been to Wisconsin, the northern part of the state is kind of uh, an area where corn doesn't grow all that well, but you've got these pasture land, you can keep cows, and you're right north of what we call the Corn Belt, which is the part of the Midwest, the American Midwest, where people rotate corn and soybeans. Okay. And so it makes sense, if you look at the geography of these things, to concentrate the best land to produce animal feed, so field corn and soybeans, to keep the cows close by, the dairy cows close by, and produce um, dairy products, I mean, to produce milk and other dairy products. And if, but at one point in time, if you go back in the early days of uh, places like Wisconsin or upstate New York, where a lot of uh, dairy cows are kept today, people used to do a lot more things. But they realized as they were able to ship things over long distances, that what they were really good at was producing milk and dairy products. And so naturally, some parts of the United States became the dairy belt, another part became the corn belt. Uh, you've got, for example, Eastern Washington State that has a very good climate to grow apples. Right. So most of the apple in the United States are produced there. Uh, strawberries in California, which is always a contentious issue these days. <laughs> you go back a century, the uh, strawberry capital of the United States was actually Delaware. Most of the strawberries that uh, that were uh, delivered to um, northeastern American cities came from Delaware or Virginia or that, that part of the, the mid-Atlantic coast. But over time, new uh, strawberry varieties were developed in California, and it turned out that climate uh, California just had the best conditions to grow strawberries. So strawberry production migrated from a few locations, including Delaware, to mostly today California, and then a little bit in Oregon and Florida. 
But again, even in California, people used to produce most of their food for themselves. So transportation, access to market, access to capital, and uh, I don't want to go too historical on you, but <laughs> there was a lot of innovation in California. When the, today we think of California as having always produced, uh, you know, fruits and, uh, you know, the salad you find at your supermarket. But in the early days of the industry, most of the markets were in the Midwest and the East Coast. So people in California had to innovate a lot to develop varieties that would withstand transportation. And a lot of money also had to be invested to develop better preservation technologies. And there's actually a fascinating economic history there. I won't go into the details, but people in California had to be very innovative to make their state competitive because they were so far away from markets. So comparative advantage do change over time. And uh, what's something that people tend to forget in the history of agricultural production is that you know, California was not blessed from the beginning as this giant agricultural powerhouse than it is today. People had to be creative, and the same is true for other parts of the world. But, you know, you let people be creative, you give them good transportation infrastructure, you give them access to market, and they naturally tend to specialize in a niche that will, they will find profitable. Okay, and so you think that uh, in places like Africa and Asia... Where, where the same, the same processes yeah. will happen. I mean, uh, the, the, the problem in Africa now is that... Uh, even in most of sub-Saharan Africa, most people live kind of far from a road that can be used here. Mm -hmm. well, the transportation is really bad. And so it's really costly to move things in Africa. And that's why, again, most people subsist on what they can grow themselves because the transportation costs are just too high. So if uh, African cities are allowed to develop, if you can provide good infrastructural access from the countryside to cities in Africa, then I'm confident that just as happened in Japan, just as happened in Europe, just as has happened in Australia, New Zealand, and elsewhere, people will spontaneously leave subsistence farming behind. It's called subsistence farming for a reason. I mean, mm -hmm. You'll remain poor if you don't specialize right. in what you do best. So, uh, yeah, open market uh, infrastructure will come in time. These people will be allowed to specialize, and they'll, and they'll produce more food on less land. And just as we did in North America, a lot of, land, a lot of bad agricultural land in North America was abandoned over time. I don't know how many of your readers are from Vermont, New Hampshire, or New England. You drive through those states today, you believe that, you know, there were always forests there. No, it, it used to be essentially pasture land for sheep and horses, which, because it was very uh, unproductive, was eventually abandoned. Nature took over. So the same thing will happen in Africa if they go through, if they're allowed to go through the same development process that we experience in North America. Yeah, and I mean, something else that's, that's interesting is uh, having access to roads also allows you to buy Yes. From, from markets like in North America and would allow us to buy from them because uh, yes. I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a foodie, as Pierre knows. And so one thing that I will ask when I meet someone from a, a new place is I say, what's the food you miss yes. the most? And the best way we can have poor people <laughs> in a place like Africa is to buy their products. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I hear, whenever I ask someone from Africa, I hear about a fruit that I've never had before, or they tell me that our pineapples are terrible. Yes. And what they miss is African pineapples. So I would really love access to these pineapples that are mind delicious. That are tasty, delicious. that are tastier, yes. Um, okay. But they probably do not withstand transportation. Very yeah, well, so. that's just it. Well, you know, uh, maybe if we maybe. were trading them. Yes. Um, I have a couple of other questions, and sorry for everyone who I'm, I'm kind of looking down. Normally I look right at my computer, but I'm, I'm dividing my attention today to try and keep us on time. I have a few more questions. Uh, so the first one is the fair trade movement arose to address concerns people have with the working conditions of laborers abroad. What are the merits of fair trade and how can these goals be addressed by free trade? And that's from Richard. Thanks very much, yes. Richard. Well, there is this notion that you can improve the lot of agricultural workers by paying them more uh, to produce essentially uh, the same product that they, were, that they would be trying to sell you at the moment. Well, there are two things I believe that fair trade advocates do not understand. The first is that the best way to help agricultural workers is paradoxically to get them out of agriculture. Farmers in North America are wealthy because 1% of our population, one or 2% of our population produces most of our food. So the best way to be kind to help a, an agricultural worker is to make him more productive and uh, you know to give him more machinery and uh, more things to produce uh, what they do. But the thing is, w once you do that, you don't need a lot of workers. Mm -hmm. So the best way, paradoxically, to help a lot of migrant workers in less advanced economies is to provide them, you know, full-time, well-paid city jobs. Right. This is exactly what happened in a country like Canada or the United States. A century ago, about 40% of the population was still involved in farming, 
most of them were very poor. And in time, though, better city jobs were created. The people who remained in the countryside became much more productive. This is why farmers today are relatively wealthy in North America. And, uh, and this is why we have a huge middle class, because people left the countryside to move to cities. The other problem with fair trade is that I don't want to get into the technical details, but there is a huge ideological dimension behind it. So, for example, uh, if you buy fair trade coffee, it must typically come from a producer's cooperative, mm -hmm. which will not allow, um, let's say, for example, children to work. But the problem is that in less advanced economy, like used to be the case in Canada, the school year is often scheduled around the harvest period of the main crop. Right. So, for example, in Canada, Atlantic Canada used to produce a lot of potatoes, and the school year in Atlantic Canada was scheduled around the potato harvest, right, so meaning that their kids would be <laughs> off school when they were needed to harvest potatoes. Okay. And this is an income that the family really needs. This is why it was scheduled around. But uh, fair trade often prevents the, the employment of children, which provide a supplemental income for the family that they often need. But ultimately, the problem with fair trade is that it's basically built on charity. You're asked to uh, pay more for what is often a lesser quality product rather than let the best producers spontaneously emerge. And it's sad to say, but you don't build a thriving economy on charity. So yeah. what this country needs is uh, real economic development, better opportunities out of the countryside, and let the people who will remain in the countryside become more productive. Yeah. This is how you will really help people through free trade and specialization in other lines of work. Yeah, and we could easily talk for an hour about all of those questions. But um, if anybody has more, don't feel like you can't ask about fair trade just because I said that. Uh, but I do have another question um, from Phil. So he says, my friend says that the seller of an apple produced overseas and ships to America externalizes the cost of carbon dioxide emitted by transporting the apple. Can you comment on this? Yes. Uh, well, it's typically not true. Uh, so. Prices are not perfect in the agricultural sector because we've got production subsidies, we've got barriers to trade. But you've got to ask yourself, well, we can produce decent apples in North America. Why do we see apples from New Zealand, Chile, or South mm -hmm. Africa at certain times of the year? And as a geographer, I will tell you that the main reason is latitude. So <laughs> in, the northern in the northern hemisphere, we harvest our apples typically in September or October. You want to eat them in April or May, what do you do? Well, you need to put them in cold storage mm -hmm. and, you know, high CO2 concentrations. There's a cost associated with that. Uh, you will have some losses due to spoilage. And so if you want to eat a North American apple in March or April, there's a huge uh, footprint associated with the storage and losses associated with storage. Now, if you, if you buy a New Zealand apple in March or April, what happens? Well, in the Southern Hemisphere, seasons are inverted. Uh, so, of course, in North America, we think of Christmas as occurring in winter, right? But you go to New Zealand, it's the middle of their yeah, summer. we do it all wrong. Exactly. <laughs> and so what happens if you import, if you buy a New Zealand apple in uh, March or April? Well, it was probably on the tree like 10 days before. Right. And so you don't have this huge footprint associated with storage. Now, of course, uh, we began importing New Zealand apple not because we thought of you know the problems associated with storage, but because they were cheaper for the same quality, but they were cheaper because of the time of the year at which they were picked, and the time of the year was a function of the latitude at which they were picked. So no, the, we, we do import produce from the southern hemisphere because they have a lot, because they're cheaper, and they are cheaper because they have a lower footprint. You need less electricity, you need less yeah. natural gas uh, to keep uh, the system going. But of course, the system works both ways. I mean, if you think New Zealand and food, you might think New Zealand and Kiwis. But you go to New Zealand at certain times of the year, and the kiwis that you eat will be coming from Italy. Why? <laughs> because Italy is in the northern hemisphere. Right. Again, they harvest their kiwis at different times of the year. So at certain times of the year, you will have New Zealand kiwis in Italy. At other times of the year, um, Ital Italian kiwis in New Zealand. And that's because transportation has much less of a footprint than storage over long periods of time. So your friend is wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I have another question that's similar, and then uh, I'm going to move us forward, but uh, sending questions at any time, guys. Uh, don't feel like you have to wait for me to say, do you have any questions? I will get to them uh, when we stop. So this is kind of uh, similar. Uh, Danny asks, I live in southern Alberta. Recently I bought some puffed wheat cereal at the grocery store and was stunned to read on the label that the cereal was an imported product. How is it possible that puffed wheat is an imported good in Western Canada? So people who don't know all about Western Canada, it's just 
fields of grain. Yes, wheat pulses, and, yeah. soybeans, and, yeah. and so it it is. It does seem counterintuitive, which is why he's asking. Well, uh, there's a there's an old joke about Western Canada is that well, it's, it's not really a running joke, but for years in Saskatchewan, which you know for American viewers think of North Dakota here, it's basically the same. Yeah, it's right. They're right. Yeah, they've, they've been saying for years, why don't we have a pasta plant in Saskatchewan? And the short answer is that there's no money in making pasta. You can make money in a place like southern Alberta or Saskatchewan producing grains, and you get good money for that. But they don't have a competitive advantage in producing pasta. They're too far from market. Uh, if you were to uh, this is, think of it this way, historically, most of petroleum refineries, for example, were close to city. Why? Because it made a lot more sense to ship raw petroleum over long distances and turn it into hundreds of products closer to markets. Right. So there are huge economies of scale in processing things closer to markets and then shipping some of the final product back to where the raw okay. material was produced. But the, those the cereals or whatever were only a small part, even if the grain was from southern Alberta, only a small portion of the grain that was produced there was sent back because you don't have many people who live in southern Alberta. No. So it probably made more sense to produce those cereals closer to markets in the Midwest or you know the northeast of the United States. And it's where most of let's say the Alberta grain or the North Dakota grain ended up. Okay. So this is why it doesn't make there there are such things as economies of scale in food processing and it's much easier to move raw materials over long distances turn them into all sorts of things closer to markets and then ship back a tiny portion of the finished products back to where uh, some of the raw material originated. But you've got to think of the whole picture here. This is why you need economic geography. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to move forward uh, and the first thing we're going to talk about is the, uh, the results of the poll, which I did share, but I'll just share for another second um, so that everybody can remember. Uh, so 65% of people say that they think that it makes since to be uh, trading food over long distances, they may not be new to the topics that we're talking about. Um, but we do have some concerns, which I think are, are pretty common out there. Uh, so what a six percent of people said yes, uh, it makes sense to environmental sense. I'm sorry, not just sense to trade food over long distances, but only during certain times of year. And so we've sort of talked about yes. why that's the case. Um, I'm I'm going to hide the results, guys, so that you can see us. Hopefully, we're a little bit more interesting than a bar graph. Um, <laughs> the the second group is uh, yes, but only for certain foods, and we've talked a little bit about that. Um, for instance, uh, the kiwis coming from different yes. places, or um, bananas not coming from Canada. Or again, at all. Uh, why do you why don't you find Florida oranges in your supermarket? Well, because California, even though you might think they're at the same latitude and the climate is well, no, California is just a better climate to produce higher quality yeah. products. And I know that that's that's actually uh, if you follow this kind of debate, um, people in Florida and California are really upset that they trade oranges with each other. Yes, um, but they're not <laughs> trading the same oranges. Right, and right, This exactly. is the irony of the thing. It's like saying, well, we import cars from Germany. Well, yeah, but they're not exactly the same cars that we have. Yeah. So. Um, and some people say very rarely they're sk still skeptical, but hopefully they're ask, uh, thinking of questions to ask so that we can address their concerns. And oh, nobody says that we should never environmentally, uh, from an environmental perspective, I'm sorry, uh, ship long distances. I'm going to, sorry I'm, to interrupt, I'm going to very quickly, uh, we have one question just asking for a clarification sure. of comparative advantage. So I'm going to try and give a short uh answer that's a little bit less roundabout than what we did. And basically what it is is that you have a, a relative advantage. So, um, Well, let's say a country is better yeah. at producing everything, all sorts of good. It still makes sense to specialize in the good at which you're relatively better uh, right. at producing it. And at the other country, which is not better than you at producing anything, to specialize in the thing that they're relatively better at producing. Right. And this is what it means. But to be honest, in the aggregate, this applies in, you know, in manufacturing and all sorts of other industry. But I'll be honest, as an economic geographer, I'll tell you that absolute advantage in agriculture is pretty hard to overcome. Yeah. But again, the point that we were trying to make is that, uh, let's say, a, a place like California might be better at producing everything than Guatemala. So software, uh, chick well, chickpeas or whatever producing mm -hmm. stuff. But it still makes sense for most people in California, even though they're better at everything, to specialize in producing computers or software and to import produce that they might even be better than, let's say, Guatemala producing, and to let people in Guatemala go uh, produce what they're relatively better at. 
So okay. I don't know if that is. Uh... Yeah, hopefully that's helpful. If it's not helpful, um, email me. I'll put my email on the screen at the end, and I'll try to send you some uh, resources that might make it a little bit more clear for you. Uh, because if you're interested, I want to I want to help. Um, so we're going to uh, move forward here. Uh, when you are interviewed about your book, you often talk about five myths of yes. localism, and I think that they'll be interested for interesting for the people who are interested in this topic. So why don't we start off with since we were just talking about environmental sense, yes. um, the argument that it's environmentally better. So there are a few reasons that people think this. They think, oh, um, well, there's one reason really. Well, it's it's, transpor it's transportation, transportation is a big one. Yeah, and 95 percent of our transportation system powered by fossil fuels. Yes. So it's it's mostly obviously uh, well you know diesel products, bunker fuels, um, and ships. And so uh, the idea is that well you know you burn fossil fuels, you emit uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If you produce things closely, well you don't need to move things over long distances, and therefore it is better for the environment. But the problem when you do that is that you you forget why. Uh, Historically, agricultural productions began to move to other regions, and that's because transportation is only a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall environmental footprint of producing food. So, for example, when you produce food, well, you might need irrigation water. Mm -hmm. If you use uh, greenhouses, well, you might need natural gas to heat the greenhouse. Uh, you might need grow lights, not just for marijuana, but you know, <laughs> for all sorts of other things. If you have a short day, you yes, if you have a short day, you need grow that. lights. Yeah. And so what happened in Europe, for example, is that, again, historically, people used to grow a lot of tomatoes in places like England in greenhouses. But what happened over time is that uh, the production naturally migrated along the uh, Mediterranean coast because now more irrigation water is available there, and they have non-eated greenhouses, which have the advantage of, of course, protecting the uh, tomatoes from the elements, the wind, and other things, but also of keeping more humidity. Uh, around the tomatoes. So they get tremendous yields along the Mediterranean coast and they need a lot less energy to produce a tomato than having uh, to build a heated greenhouse in a place like England. And so even though you might need to truck the tomatoes from Spain to England, uh, the amount of fuel that you burn doing that is much less than uh, the amount of uh, carbon fuels that you would need to heat your greenhouse year round, well almost year round yeah. in England. So this is only uh, one aspect. Another advantage, um, another environmental advantage of long distance uh, food production is that, again, uh, I don't know how many of you have a garden, but if you're trying to grow food in your garden, there might be a shadier area, which is better mm -hmm. to grow something else. There might be more sunlight than another. Uh, perhaps you have a type of soil that is better suited for something than another. And perhaps, you know, in your backyard, I'm thinking of a friend of mine, he's absolutely incapable of growing carrots. He doesn't know why, but okay. carrots just don't grow there. <laughs> so it's no matter how hard he tried, he wasn't able to grow carrots. So it makes sense to concentrate uh, food productions in the regions that are the best suited for them. That way you get a lot more food on a lot less land than would mm -hmm. otherwise be the case. And in that context, the more efficient you become, let's say, for example, uh, Again, to get back to apple production in eastern Washington, what's one of their main advantages? Well, you have a very dry climate. So you need less pesticide. You have less of a pest problem. You have less of a fungicide problem. And so you can produce more apple using less uh, pesticides, which are costly yeah. and require fossil fuels and what have you. So in that context, again, moving things efficiently over long distances means that you can you have over overall, you need less land to produce mm -hmm. the same amount of food than if you were trying to produce everything inefficiently closer to your home. So this is why, for yeah. example, today, uh, the surface area devoted to uh, farmland in North America keeps shrinking. And this is why our forests keep uh, growing, because people moved out of Appalachia to produce food. Right. People moved out of areas that were not good for producing food, and they concentrated their production in the best locales. Um, and I've just changed the slide at the bottom of the screen now. You should be able to see a picture yes. of a very dire looking situation. And this was slash and burn farming in, in Finland. In Finland. In a context which is not too different of the slash and burn farming in a place like Appalachia in the United mm -hmm. States. I don't know how many of you are from, let's say, Western North Carolina or even Northeastern Georgia or even upstate New York. But as you know, trying to grow things on rock is not <laughs> a very easy thing to do. So what were people doing back then? Well, they would get the best wood out of it, then they would burn the landscape, uh, the ashes would allow you to get maybe one or two mediocre crop, and then you would move on to another piece of land and you know you would cut the wood again and burn the landscape. And you just produce food very inefficiently, 
moving around whatever area, piece of land you own. And uh, this created tremendous erosion problems historically. But then what happened uh, when in the United States, for example, when the Midwest opened with the railroad, people said, well, I'm not making a living in Maine trying to grow cereal grains, I'm moving to Ohio. And so a lot of land was abandoned in Maine and New Hampshire, for example, the forest grew back. And in the end, I think nature is better off, humans are better off. And so again, long distance trade actually lightens the load of agriculture on the land. Which and I I um I almost can't help myself. I have to mention, and I will just send a I will send a resource to everybody about the history of there's an, an old forest in, that is owned by Harvard University. Is yes, that, Western Massachusetts. Um, and it's kind of it's really interesting to understand the history of American farming and how it's affected these hardwood forests um, in New England. It, it, it's it's really cool, uh, but sort of off topic. So I, I will uh, anybody who's interested, I can let you know. Um, so, we actually have a website now. You can access it. Oh, online. great! Even better. Yes. <laughs> um, and so the other argument um, that a lot of people say is that it's better for the local economy yes. if we if we produce our food here. So if I'm but if I'm from southwestern Ontario, which is basically like the American Northeast in terms yes. of uh, well, the American Midwest. Or, Sorry to okay, yeah, well, definitely we're, uh, you have it depends how far, yeah, 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 sorry, sorry, not the Northeast because we don't have the, the rocks, but the American Midwest, so we grow a lot of things, so um, down there, it, people seem to say, well, why don't we buy, if we're in Ontario, why don't we buy Ontario tomatoes, because yes. a lot of tomatoes are grown in Ontario, why don't we buy things here, and then we have farmers in Ontario, and farmers have a, a good job. And then they allegedly. will spend money, they will yeah, buy exactly. restaurants, and they will have baristas like you, <laughs> and they'll have more money for the barista, will then exactly. get a haircut, and they will then, you know. Exactly. Yes. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that you should buy food based on price and quality. Um, so if you always try to best, uh, to get the best deal that you get in terms of food, that leaves more money in your pocket to spend on other things. So the problem, well, look at it this way. Okay, we still do not import food from outer space as far as I know. I might be wrong on that. So good quality food will need to be produced somewhere. And obviously at certain times of the year, the best quality food will be produced close to where some people live. So at certain times of the year, it makes perfect sense to buy local food when it's in season. I mean, that's the best quality price ratio you can get. Go for it. I don't have a problem with that. The problem I have is when local food activists tell you, well, you should pay more for right. lesser quality in order to keep those inefficient farmers in business. Because again, if you, uh, if you keep them in business, then they will spend money locally and other people will benefit. But if you do that, if you pay more for less quality food, then you have less money to pay for other things. So suddenly you don't have the money to go to the movie theater if you still do that. Uh, you cannot, <laughs> uh, maybe you'll have to give up on a haircut. Right. Uh, maybe you won't be so generous when you tip the barista yeah. if you can still afford Starbucks. <laughs> so that's the thing. Uh, you need to go beyond what is immediately visible. So if uh, local farmers uh, give you the best, you know, quality price ratio at certain time of the year, please, then you're creating real wealth. But if you're maintaining inefficient people in business, then no, it's a form of charity, which is not really charity because in the end, you're making everyone else better, uh, worse off. So what that, what happened countless times historically is that at some point, you know, farmers that have made a good living, again, let's say growing, uh, well, people don't know that today, but people used to produce wine in Los Angeles a century ago. But the quality okay. was really not good. <laughs> so at one point, people said, no, we're not buying wine from Southern California anymore. It's really not good. So what happened to the local farmers? Well, they began to produce citrus fruits. And they were really good at that. So they transitioned from one type of production to another. And they became very successful. So local people in Los Angeles were buying citrus fruits. But people in the rest of the United States, too, were buying citrus fruits. And farmers were better off because they not only had a local market, but they had a national market. Right. So farmers were actually, the, the way to create wealth among local farmers is to let them find a niche that they can be really good at and sell both locally, but also beyond local borders. I mean, that's how you create a real standard of living. And by having people uh, spend, uh, spend less money on their food by buying from the best producers, then they have more money to spend on other things and they create all sorts of other jobs. Yeah. So in the end, everybody's better off. Yeah. And d dare I say, uh, arguing that you ought to pay more for your food is a little bit of a well, privileged thing to say. Well, yes. I was, you you I have to be that. the type of person who can afford to spend more yes, on your food. But you are talking about creating jobs locally. Yeah. But yes, no, from a strictly moral point of view, uh, yes, you know, there are plenty of foodies who can afford to pay, I don't know, $10 a pound for peaches or something. Right. But, uh, 
most people cannot, and this is yeah, there's a moral dimension here, which is a bit different. Yeah. Um, so I actually I've I've got a little bit of a buildup of questions. So why don't we why don't we take a couple? Um, so I've got what is your opinion? In, uh, I'm sorry. What is your opinion on alternative methods of agriculture, such as aquaponics, hydroponics, etc.? Et yes. Thank you for not. I would have continued reading them if you had listed them all. Do you think that we can create a more sustainable world if people in urban cities begin yes. to grow a little bit of their own food to supplement their groceries? What implications would this have on the food economy and carbon emissions? Okay, what people don't realize is that there used to be sophisticated uh, agricultural production systems around cities until the turn of the 20th century. So I have pictures of, people don't realize that let's say as late as 1880s, about one sixth of the greater Paris area was still devoted to food production. Mm -hmm. And so I could show you paintings or images of Parisian farmers back then, and they were very sophisticated. They would build walls around their gardens to create microclimates, get one or two degrees more. Uh, they had plenty of access to horse manure because that's before the car came along. Then they would have cloche. You know, today we use little plastic tents, but in those days they had kind of big glass containers, translucent, that they would put on let's say their asparagus Jeez. to create artificial heat <laughs> uh, to grow their things and then they would put straw mats on top of dark straw mats because you know you want to re uh, you want to repulse uh, radiance over heat you build uh, you make your building white but you make something darker then it, you will create artificial heat that way and again there were huge greenhouses around places like minneapolis but the thing is that no matter how efficient they were, they could not compete with, let's say, Florida or the Mediterranean coast. Mm -hmm. In one context, nature will give you a heat free of charge. In another, you've got to create other things. And the other thing, too, is that um, we don't think of, a think of producing food in cities. Uh, let's say you want to produce pigs. Well, what will happen? You will need to truck in a lot of uh, animal feed to grow mm -hmm. your pigs in the city. And then where will you slaughter them? I mean, slaughterhouses used to be prevalent in cities, but we were happy to get rid of them, ship them to the countryside because there was a huge problem. Land in city in the end is just too valuable to be used for food production. That's why it was pushed out. Land is much more affordable in places like Iowa in the United States or, you know, again, uh, the rural parts of Florida or California. So don't think that people in the past were not creative when they were producing food in cities. They were extremely creative. But again, to get back to absolute and comparative advantage, you just cannot compete with cheap, abundant, open farmland um, and uh, nature giving you heat free of charge or helping you fight bugs and fungus problems. And so in the end, the only thing that you can really grow in cities will be high-end products. Uh, let's say on rooftop gardening, the only markets that I've ever seen uh, is, uh, that only seem to make sense are very expensive things for very fancy restaurants mm -hmm. where you could probably get the same quality of, uh, of produce for a lot less money if it was uh, shipped in from elsewhere, but there's a premium associated to local, so some people make a go on that. But don't think that uh, fancy strategies were not tried in the past. And again, people don't realize how significant absolute advantages are in agriculture. So I think land in cities should be devoted to other types of uses, which is what markets tell you. And this is why food production historically, which was abundant in cities, was eventually shipped back. Okay. Uh, hopefully that answered yes. your question. Uh, if not, feel free to follow up. Uh, so I've got another one. There's a debate on uh, from Rick, sorry. There's a debate in cli about chi climate change causing less food production and suggesting that gains won't be as large uh, with higher temperatures. And uh, Rick is concerned that he's misrepresenting the argument, but he's doing his best. No, okay. and, um, intuitively, the higher temperature should give us more food. Can you clarify what the concern yes. might be? Okay, well, the, the concern is that regions that are well suited to produce certain things at the moment will no longer be well suited. Than be well suited to produce them if suddenly you know we, you have droughts or you have warmer temperature or what have you but and so you have climate models that tell you that but the problem is that typically those people don't know much about agricultural history uh, i've given you a number of examples so far but historically farmers have had to adapt uh, to change their productions a lot over time for economic reasons again listen uh, there's something like one or two percent of our population in north america that feeds the rest of us those that stayed in that line of work were the best and smartest ones. Farmers have to adapt to changing market conditions all the time. Uh, I was telling you earlier now that Italy is a big kiwi producer. Uh, that's a fairly recent development. At one point, farmers in Italy were you know, pulling their hairs off saying, we can produce anything. 
uh, competitively, but then some farmers said, well, why not kiwis? And they, they <laughs> found a niche in there and they adapted to produce some kiwis and they became very good at it. So farmers change their, and adapt all the time for economic conditions. So even assuming the worst case scenario, let's say that the climate of uh, uh, Boston suddenly becomes the climate of New York, which is what you would get with you know those uh, climate change things. Well, farmers in New England are not stupid. You know they've had to change productions in the past. They will be able to adapt, I believe. Uh, again, the the one I, I grew up in the countryside. That's why I think I know a little bit what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The ones that sit in the, in that line of work were the smart ones, and they will have to adapt for no other reason than economic conditions will change over time. So even if we have climate change, I believe that the farmers will find other ways to produce and things. I'm not too worried about that. Okay. Um, so I can get back uh, to the myths that you normally yes. address. Uh, so there's, there's, uh, we've talked a little bit about um, people, especially foodies, being interested in local food. And the argument is often that you know they're the more nutritious, they're tastier yes. because they're fresh. Uh, so what do you what do you say to that? Well, the issue of taste is not so much because of freshness, because in this day and age, preservation technologies are very good. You know, if you pack a bag of, uh, let's say that you grow things in Mexico, um, and you pack them in the, under the best conditions right away, uh, frozen food is just as nutritious as fresh food. And actually, it might be more nutritious than fresh food that was picked. Let's say on a Tuesday and delivered to the farmer's market on a Saturday. In that case, the frozen food might actually be more nutritious. Uh, so there's no argument really there. And in some cases, paradoxically, uh, I've read somewhere that canned tomatoes are actually more nutritious than fresh tomatoes because they're cooked and your body can digest more. Oh, interesting. Okay. But, uh, but uh, I'm not going to go there. So the, the, <laughs> the nutritious argument doesn't make sense. Now, the food argument is something else. Um, we were talking earlier about how, let's say, pineapples in North America don't taste as good as pineapples elsewhere. And that's because, obviously, uh, the type of peaches or pineapples that we find in our supermarkets are the ones that can uh, stand uh, transportation best. Mm -hmm. So it might be that, uh, you know, in many countries where more food is local, people will grow tastier varieties that don't uh, withstand transportation all that well. But two things here. Uh, for in that case, then local food uh, producers do not need a local food movement. People will in season mm -hmm. when the food is available. People will buy, you know, the better tasting peaches or the better tasting pineapples. But then you've got to understand that if you want fresh produce uh, in your supermarket in regions that are not suited to uh, grow certain types of food, well, the choice is done between you know those tasty South Carolina peaches and Alberta peaches that were delivered over a long distance. It's between the lesser quality peaches and no peaches at all. Right. So, yeah, if you happen to live in a region which is very good at growing peaches, then you can get tastier varieties. Yeah. But in season, what do you do the rest of the year? And again, if you want fresh uh, stuff, well, the alternative then is between nothing and the varieties that would stand transportation better. So if you really want the taste of those South Carolina peaches that mm -hmm. don't travel well, I'm afraid if we move to South Carolina at certain <laughs> times of the year, there's yeah. no other way. Well, and, and uh, so I, I made a terrible error when I said that I used to live in southwestern Ontario in the American Northeast, because I now live in Ottawa, Ontario, which is like the American Northeast. More the American Northeast, Northeast. yeah. And um, even if we want to have the good peaches and the good tomatoes that we grew where I grew up, um, in the summer you can get, uh, there's a, a white flesh peach that they yes. can grow in uh, southwestern Ontario that's really delicious. And, um, we can get them in the summer, but they're not local. They come in from further away. And even uh, now you may see um, heritage variety. Well, not her they are heritage variety. They don't need quotes. Um, tomatoes on the grocery store, and they're always like $7 a pound or something ridiculous like that. Uh, well, not, I mean, that's what it costs because you have to do all of these extra things to get yes. them there undamaged. And, and then they might not be so resistant to yeah. fast and things. They might be more susceptible well, to failure. And not only that, but they're still damaged. Yes. Once, once you just stacking them up the way that they stack yes. them up in the grocery store means the ones on the bottom will be smushed. Yes. Um, and so I, I think that after learning that from you it's, and from your book, um, I've, I noticed these things and I think, I think it's interesting uh, because we are still trying to get that taste. But in places like the American Northeast, where we're, we're hopeless, um, yeah. we have to do it by still getting food from further away. So it's, it's been interesting to watch. Um, another argument for local food is that it builds social capital, which is kind of a uh, academic way of saying that you get to know your farmer. You get to know your farmer. And you build a community. You, yes. um, and by building a community, uh, especially this is the argument for um, 
what is it? You can get a basket of food from your uh, from your farmer. Yes, or, the community supported agriculture. Right, and yes. so so you're supporting even if they have trouble, you're helping to support a local community. Uh, so what what are the problems with arguments? Okay, like well, that? it seems nice. It seems, yeah, it seems like nice. It's well, they, they, but there are two things. Um, first, if you're doing it, for the, so community supported agriculture is basically a scheme in which you pay in advance right. for the food that you will get during and, the summer, and you don't really know what you're going to get. And you're you're not well. There are two problems. You don't really know what you're going to get. And it might not be suitable to what you want. The problem is that it gives you no flexibility. So let's say, for example, that uh, you order food in advance for a family of four. And then suddenly you get the opportunity to send the kids away for the summer for uh, a month, visit a, you know, a relative living somewhere. Mm -hmm. You're still getting food for four people. Right. So what are you going to do with it? And the problem with community-supported agriculture is that it's been found that it's very good for growing your compost pile. So you get oh, a lot yeah. more food, Waste. you have no flexibility, and at the same time, uh, what do you do if uh, guests, uh, if your relatives show up and decide to stay at your place for a week? Well, you need to go to the supermarket, yeah. because even though you've ordered things in advance, you need to adjust things. And what people don't realize is that things like supermarkets or uh, intermediaries between farmers and uh, consumers emerge for a reason. You know, we take these things for granted, but getting Buying the amount of food that you want uh, at a time that is convenient, at a location that is close to you, rather than, let's say, driving an hour and a half to the farm and getting back. You know, all the extra time and money that is involved in those games is time and money that you don't have to uh, give to a local charity, to coach Little League soccer, to do other things. So far, intermediaries actually deliver value. You get a lot more uh, convenience, flexibility, and lower prices by going to a place like a supermarket than buying directly from a farmer, which is why supermarkets emerge uh, in the first place. And again, there are many ways to build social capital. Yes, you will get to know your farmer, but then you won't again have as much money to do other things on the side that might help build social capital. So um, it's nice to get to know, but you know, it's nice to get to know the people who produce your food, but I have no idea who produced that mug, mm -hmm. I have no idea who produced my watch, my clothes. Uh, if there is a price to pay in our modern system is that you lose track of the uh, primary producer. But at the same time, I would argue, because we're wealthier, because we have more time for leisure, because we have more time to volunteer to do other things, I would argue that there's probably a lot more capital today. And uh, at any rate, you're, uh, you have more time and resources to contribute to developing social capital if you want to because of our modern system. Yeah, and I'm, I always, uh, I'm always kind of forced to point out to people that um, it's cool to it is it is fun to go to farmers markets. Oh, like is. I I I go to them. I, like, as I said, I'm kind of a foodie, and sometimes there are things that you don't see other places. And farmers do actually know a lot about the things that they're producing, whereas they go. But then you're paying for the experience. Right. Exactly. It's it's kind of you know it's, it's enjoyable. So right it's, it's like a social outing. It's like going to I don't know a, a car an old car exhibit. You know, you get to know people who know a lot about old cars, and if you have an interest in old car, well, you get to know people. That's nice. Farmers market are a bit like that. They're a bit of a luxury good. Uh, I have nothing against luxury yeah. good. If you enjoy the experience, fine. But if you think that your community will be better off in the end or that the environment will benefit, uh, no, not really. And you should not even assume that this is the best way to build social capital. Yeah. Sorry, I'm talking too much. Like an no, 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 here. it's okay. I, I was just going to say, and the other thing is uh, a farmer's market will uh, provide work for the farmers, but yes. a grocery store actually provides work for, for farmers and clerks yes. and people who are, are really kind of at the, like, not at all of them, but it certainly provides an opportunity for people with very little work experience to start to get into the workforce and building. Those are really important um, things that we do that build social yes. capital in our communities. Uh, so I, let's talk about um, what might be the biggest uh, argument, uh, or at least the most uh, people get very excited security. about, the argument of security, yes. food security. Can so, you rely on those pesky Canadians? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Right? Uh, how can we trust other countries to provide us with our food supply? And people yes. are worried about that. Yes, so no, what would you say to that? Okay, well, you have to understand that historically famine and malnutrition were the law of uh, human beings the world over. Why was that? Well, because it doesn't matter in which ecosystem you live, it doesn't matter what you produce, uh, you will have bad years from time to time. You know, a drought, a flood, uh, epidemics that will uh, kill your livestock. Uh, people might remember, even if you're young, that two years ago the Midwest had a serious uh, drought. Yeah. Did anyone starve in the Midwest, though? Yeah. Not as far as I know. And uh, people have to remember that the uh, famine and malnutrition were defeated by one thing. 
long distance transportation. And that is because, think of it as edging your bets or spreading the risks of food production. The more you rely on people all over the place, the more it is likely that people in some regions will have very good years, you know, bumper crops, while other people elsewhere will have very terrible years. But if you can move a lot of food cheaply between locations, then people who have good year can help people who have bad years. But of course, a few years down the road, the people who had a terrible harvest might have a bumper crop, while people who had a good year might have a bad harvest. So uh, food security historically was achieved by spreading the risk and delocalizing essentially food production. Now, the food security argument is valid in one context. Uh, if you only have one supplier and things get rough between you, but let's say you want to buy wheat today mm -hmm. or corn. Well, you can buy wheat from Canada, Australia, France, the United States, even India at one point became so good following the Green Revolution that they were able to export wheat. So let's say that you're the Japanese, the people in the world that depend the most on uh, foreign uh, sources for their food supply. Mm -hmm. Uh, have Japanese starved since the end of the Second World War? No, they have not because they have multiple suppliers. And so, again, keep in mind that if you want to keep all your production local, you will have bad years and you will starve and you will have famines because this is what happened historically. The more suppliers you have, including local suppliers, the better off you are. Because, again, uh, some years your farmers might have bad years, but uh, other years, your farmers might have access to people who are willing to pay a lot for what they produce because they uh, they have bad years. So, spreading the risk is the way to, is the road to food security. Putting all your eggs in one regional basket, which is what uh, local food activists to you know raise the food security flag want you to do, is a recipe for disaster. It always will. It always was. It will always be. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned. So part of the reason that your book was written is because your wife is, yes. is from Japan. And, uh, somebody somebody said, oh, well, Japan, they uh, They're they the produce... most parasitical people in the world. I was because... going to try to be nicer, but no, that is what yeah, they That, that is exactly it. Yeah, it was a Canadian academic. So oh. I speak, so <laughs> Americans don't feel bad about it. Now, so this prominent academic said in front of my wife, well, and a few hundred uh, people, <laughs> that uh, Japanese people are parasitical because they import food from places like New Zealand, Brazil, and the United States. Well, if you've ever been to Japan, you have a lot of people who live on tiny islands where you really don't have a lot of good agricultural land. But what did the Japanese do? Well, most of them live in large cities and they created all sorts of things that we use in our daily life. I don't know about that camera, but it, <laughs> might, it might have been produced in Japan. But then they're not parasitical in the sense that they create value and then they buy stuff yeah. from people who have good growing conditions. A lot of land, not too many people. Countries like Canada. What's wrong with that? Again, you have more technology, more wealth being created. Uh, perhaps the laptop that we're using now is uh, made in nice. Japan. You know, you, you can buy uh, the book in uh, paper form, but you can buy it online these days. Yeah. And a lot of these technologies were probably developed by Japanese people who, because they did not have to produce food in terrible conditions or die of starvation, were able to develop technologies that benefited everyone else yeah. the world it's, over. It's really not parasitic, parasitic it's symbiotic. It's, it is uh, symbiotic, it's back and forth. because again, they buy, that's what my wife yeah. always insists, they buy, <laughs> they don't ask for charity. Yeah, exactly. They produce value and importance. Um, and the other interesting thing about Japan is um, one of the reasons that they were so uh, aggressive in their foreign policy is because they were trying to not yes. trade. So that, that well, what happened in the, if you, well, perhaps your audience is a bit young, but uh, <laughs> what happened in the late uh, 19th century is that Japan opened up to the rest of the world. They began to exporting uh, to export goods uh, to North America. They were accused of being, you know, uh, providing cheap labor. So uh, the American government began to put barriers to trade in terms of importing goods from Japan. And this paved the way for, uh, for the worst elements in Japanese society, you know, fascist military types to take over. And if I may sum up the rationale, the rationale was that, okay, well, if we won't be allowed to trade and if the food won't come to Japan, Japan will go to the food. So they invaded Taiwan to grow rice, they invaded uh, Korea and Manchuria to grow soybeans. And the rationale was that, well, we cannot rely on trade to feed us. And, you know, there's an old saying that says something like, you know, deprive a man of his meal for one day, he will lie. Deprive is a man of his meal for two days, he will steal. And deprive a, male for, uh, a man of his meal for three days and he will kill. And, you know, the old saying, if goods uh, don't cross yeah. borders, armies eventually will. I think we had a vivid illustration of that uh, in the early 20th century. 
But, you know, these days nobody's afraid of the Japanese. Why? Because they rely on the rest of the world to supply about 70% of their calories. And everybody benefits. Yeah. And the so Japanese don't worry about food. No, uh, because they have multiple suppliers. And plenty of, because they're productive, because they have money, plenty of people will want to, want to sell them food. Um, so we have a couple of questions that I think will uh, also tie into food security. Um, I have one question from India. Uh, and I'm going to ask the two together because I think that they go together. Um, so they want to know how we will feed a world of 8 billion people with, uh, if we can feed a world of 8 billion people with the help of organic farming, okay. uh, we won't solve harm, uh, hunger and stop well, climate let me, change. Let me put it this way. The problem is that uh, organic uh, has one major flaw and it is a fertilizer. In North America, you can get good yields with organic because they rely on the manure of conventional dairy productions. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, dairy cows who will eat uh, genetically modified soybeans, let's say, and from that manure, then you produce organic food. But there's simply not enough manure in the world to uh, produce food that way. And uh, because organic, for reasons that are beyond me, uh, organic rules prevent the use of synthetic fertilizers, you simply cannot. There's just not enough fertilizer in the world. Um, it's, okay, so there, that was, and then they're concerned about the ability to uh, stop climate change and solve hunger uh, with industrial farming on plantations. And then a, a similar question, the UN is predicting a 50% increase in the world food demand by 2030. Yes. What kinds of technological advances are required to support the world's increasing population and its demand for food? Would it be a good idea to grow your own food at home using alternative farming methods that we talked about earlier? This is the same person who asked about the yes. farming in cities. Um, and with software and hardware to automate the growing process and make growing your own food cool. Okay. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, a lot of urban farmers think that they're cool and they use sophisticated tools and that rural farmers somehow are not. Uh, trust me, farming in the countryside today relies a lot more on plastic, software, you know, drip irrigation, agriculture, uh, Roundup Ready soybeans and stuff. There has been a lot of innovation in the countryside and there's nothing really that you can do in the city that you cannot do more cheaply in the countryside, even using the same uh, general approaches. So. Uh, you know, organic farming is essentially how uh, humanity used to produce food all the way up to the late 19th century, to the 19th century when, uh, you know, uh, mineral fertilizers came along and synthetic fertilizers and modern technologies. Uh, these technologies were uh, invented for a reason. And it is because, you know, there's a saying today that there's enough food in the world to feed everybody. The problem is one of distribution. Are we still on? <laughs> oh, I just I've just accidentally put uh, put this in the background. Sorry, guys. Okay, no, no. Well, the point I was trying to make is that yes, today there are roughly a little bit more than seven billion people. There's enough food to feed seven billion people, but we have, we still have a billion people who are hungry. Two things to say about that. Uh, there's only enough food to feed seven billion people because of modern technologies. Mm -hmm. Organic could not do it. And the only reason and and today though about one person in seven is malnourished. In the 1950s, when the world population was about 2.5 billion people, uh, you still had about a billion people who were not uh, fed, who were malnourished. So it was one in 2.5 by, by then. So there are a lot more people today who actually eat a lot more, we live a lot longer, we're taller and healthier than our ancestors. But somehow with new technologies, we've actually reduced the proportion of people who overall are malnourished. So yes, there are problems in our system today but things were a lot worse mm -hmm. a few decades ago. I mean, I, I will not go into the Green Revolution in India, and I know that this is a touchy topic, yeah. but the point is that people used to starve in India. And now you have people who are malnourished in India, and you know things are certainly not perfect, and I've seen it with my own eyes. But things are a lot better than they used to be. And so I believe that the lesson that you should draw from history is that we need to keep pushing forward with uh, ever more inventive and creative ways of uh, creating lesser problems than those that exist at the moment. Not turn back the clock to some, to the imaginary bliss of, you know, of an era where people used to starve, really, uh, literally, on a regular basis. Yeah. And uh, some of the technology that I'm, I'm sad to say we won't get to talk about, but I, what I was trying to do when I accidentally showed you all my desktop was I was trying to bring up this picture of uh, yes. modern modern vegetables versus this the vegetables, vegetables that so, we were have had in the past. So and, if you look at uh, the corn picture, for example, what you have on the left side is teosinte, which is the wild ancestor of corn. And it took a while to establish that it was the wild ancestor of corn because it looks so different. Mm -hmm. But the point is that over thousands of years, you know, the ancestors of the Maya, essentially, or people who were living in central Mexico, created something that looked like modern corns. But it was a process that was long and fastidious. 
On the left, what you have there is a picture of a modern supermarket tomato, normal size, and to the right, it's a wild ancestor. And again, uh, through a lot of trial and error, you know, farmers in the past created those things. But why do we have these things today rather than the wild ancestor? Well, because you get a lot more food, a lot more uh, calories and you know, proteins or whatever from uh, all of it. Yeah, all, all of it <laughs> from uh, a smaller amount of input than was the case in the past. So again, we need to realize what our ancestors' lives were really like, and again, understand that things were developed for a reason. And trust me, we could not, you would not eat a lot of ketchup if we were only producing raw tomatoes. <laughs> With those little, little, it's, it's very it's, cute, it's, but it's yeah, very there cute. wouldn't be very And much. you can grow them in your backyard if you want to, but honestly, you won't get a lot of ketchup out of them. So. <laughs> um, so we, well, there are some more questions, but unfortunately we're out of time. I'm gonna quickly, I've got one more poll for you guys, so I'm gonna bring it up um, and give you a chance. Um, so the question is, oh, I'm sorry, this is actually the wrong question. I don't know how that happened, so I'm going to close it. You don't get to answer the last question. Um, sorry about that, guys. I don't know how that happened. Uh, so I will just go to our next, uh, to let you know what we've got coming up at Big Ideas Live. Um, our next event will be uh, called, What Can You Learn From a City Neighborhood? And hopefully you find that, Pierre knows what it's about because he does some work on the same uh, the same topic, but hope, uh, kind of being able to look around a city and see what you can learn about human cooperation and uh, the way that we build communities and what makes them work. Um, I will be, as I said, giving away copies of Pierre's book. I'll let you know either tonight or tomorrow uh, whether you've uh, won. And in, if you're interested in these topics and you can't wait for me to send you something, I've put a couple of uh, Freeman articles. The Freeman is a publication of uh, FEE, the Foundation of Economic Education. And it's uh, the first one is called Droughts, Famines, and Markets. And the second one is called Debunking the Shop Small Saturday Rationale. If you go to fee.org, which is our website, you can uh, just look them up and you'll find them very easily. If you have any questions about anything we talked about, about today or future events, uh, you can contact me. My email is on the screen there at jnielsen at fee.org. And I want to thank Pierre uh, for appearing with us today and talking about these important topics. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to let us know. But for now, we're going to sign off. Thanks, guys. <laughs>